Uh, good morning, everybody. If uh, anyone out there doesn't know who I am, I'm Cheryl Moon from All Saints, and this is another iteration of uh, All Saints Skills Extravaganza. And uh, I'm going to make a presentation today uh, on bugs, beasties, and bad stuff, or pest prevention and control in your garden. And uh, before we get started, let me say uh, I, my objectives are to help you understand the basics of what is called integrated pest management and strategies for preventing and controlling garden pests and diseases. Uh, I want to help to familiarize you with some of the beneficial critters and insects that you want around but also familiarize you with the more common diseases and more common uh, pests that you don't want around. So with that in mind, uh, we'll get started. Now I have a lot of information, so uh, I'm gonna move pretty rapidly. So if you have a question, ask, but also uh, when we get down uh, the way, I may skip over some things, but I have my slides and I can send my slides to any of you that wish them by email. I just need to know who it is and your email. And I encourage you to have a pencil and paper handy in case you want to jot down some information along the way. Some of this is going to be common sense. Some of it I'm sure you know about, but hopefully there'll be some new things that will help you uh, that you learn along the way. So with that, mind, with that in mind, Let's jump into this. Uh, I'm gonna refer to my notes from time to time here to make sure that I include what I want to include. But uh, first of all, what is integrated pest management? And this is a very important concept anymore. And it's a, it's a knowledge-based, and that's important, holistic approach to managing garden and crop pests at an acceptable level. And it emphasizes certain strategies and practices, and we call those in the biz here, cultural, physical, biological, and least toxic chemical strategies and practices. Now, this is a concept that developed back in the 1960s when as a result of coming to understand the environmental damage and health hazards uh, that were occurring of using strongly toxic chemicals such as DDT. And, uh, uh, it's now it's the accepted practice for pest management through all of the university schools of uh, agriculture and the extension services, not only in the United States, but Canada and a lot of places in the world. Now, knowledge based. What do we mean by that? Well, as you can see on the screen, one of the most important things is to know your, the microclimate of your property and garden, and that is what are the sun sunny areas, the shady areas, what are the partially sunny or shady areas, where are the wet dry areas, what are the reflective heat areas, uh, and those are reflective heat has to do with the structures on you know, the sheds and, and uh, your house and the hardscapes like your patios, uh, your driveways and so forth. Um, know the orientation of the points of compass of your house because Typically on the south side, you're going to get more sun. On the north side, it's going to be cooler and shadier. On the southwest side, you're going to have the most intense heat in the summer and the most intense sun. And the point is, is you need to know what, you need to know that because certain plants will thrive in those different types of microclimates. And one, if you plant a plant in the wrong place, it's not going to do well. And so it's important to know that. Also, it's important to know your soil pH and uh, quality. And uh, extension services now recommend that you get uh, tested, your soils tested every three years for pH and nutrients. And I will give you at the end of this some websites, one of which will, is just full of great information to include where and how to, uh, to get your uh, soil tested. And by the way, it's very inexpensive to do. I've had it done. Also know your plants in your yard and garden and their needs for sun and shade and moisture, nutrition, soil type, and so forth, uh, you know, to make sure that they're in the right place. And if they're not, and they're not doing well, it may be just as simple as moving them to the right place uh, to, to help uh, correct that problem. 
You also need to know things like the first and last frost dates. Most of Calvert County's first frost date is October 10th. Uh, Southern, extreme Southern County a little later than that, but for our purposes, October 10th. Now, what does that mean? That means 10% uh, of the time there is a frost as early as October 10th. Uh, well, that simply means like on average, one out of every 10 years, there's one. Uh, the last frost date for Calvert is uh, May 10th, and that just simply means that one out of 10 years or 10% 10 of the time, uh, on average, you can have a frost as late as May 10th. Now, after those dates, uh, for instance, in October, after October 10th, the chance of frost goes up precipitously, and uh, after October or, or May 10th, the chance of frost goes down precipitously. That's why those are called the first and last frost dates. Why is that important? Well, you don't want to plant your uh, your, your uh, hot weather plants. Um, you know, you don't want to plant them before. Uh, I keep looking at the computer. I'm sorry, instead of the camera. <laughs> you don't want to uh, plant them before that May 10th, or you run a risk of uh, frost damage on them or killing them. And you don't need to, because one of the things you need is for the soil to warm up anyway. And then after October 10th, you want to start bringing in whatever's left of the harvest of your warmer weather plants. Of course, you, you may plant a fall garden with kale or spinach, that sort of thing, and that's fine. They can withstand some frost and also sometimes taste better. Uh, some varieties can even winter over. But uh, uh, also, you want to start cleaning up uh, your garden uh, at that point as well. The other thing you need to know is your hardiness zone. Calvert County is in zone seven. Uh, now they do break it down to seven A and B, but that doesn't, for the home gardener, that's not so critical. But what zone seven means, it has to do with the lowest uh, average temperatures that uh, that the, the, that region reaches in the winter. And zone seven is, uh, the average range of low temperatures in the winter is like from zero to 10 degrees. So that means on average, it will, and it doesn't mean it'll go down there and stay there, but it will get down to uh, those, uh, those kinds of numbers. Now, why is that important? Well, if you, you can't, if you plant plants that don't, can't stand that kind of cold outside, then you're gonna have to protect them. Either that or arrange so you can bring them in in the winter. Uh, or just not plant things that can uh, that that will be affected by that cold weather. We have a lot of trouble at our house with uh, uh, with fig plants. Now microclimates have a lot to do with that, but they tend to freeze back in the winter. And we're down in the valley, so it gets a little bit colder here than it does say up on top. But uh, it and uh, they freeze back, and then when they grow back, they don't produce figs because figs produce on second growth, not on first growth. So anyway, uh, also know both insect, the insect pests, the common ones and the plant diseases uh, that appear in your area and uh, when and under what circumstances they, they appear. And we'll talk more about that later. So anyway, those are the, some of the important things that, that you need to know as far as IPM is concerned. Now there's two parts of integrated pest management that I'm gonna emphasize today. And one is prevention and one is control. Uh, prevention has to do with strategies to keep damage uh, of your plants from happening. Control has to do with action steps to control or stop pests and disease when they appear. So that's uh, where we're going. Um, strategies and practices are broken down, as I said, between uh, cultural and physical, biological and chemical. And so I'm going to start with and the prevention with uh, cultural. The reason is, is because this, uh, most of these steps have to do with prevention. Um, and the way I define them, they're those steps that you take to set up the garden for success. Uh, and these include garden sanitation. And after, after the harvest in the fall and before planting in the spring, uh, remove gar garden de uh, debris, fallen leaves, dead plants, and so forth, and maintain sanitation as best you can through the growing season also. But it's important you do that. Now, the, 
fallen leaves you can compost and everything as far as dead plants from the garden that's that depends on whether they were diseased or not if they were if they were diseased towards the end of the season or whatever you really don't want to do that you want to remove them either carry them off way out in the woods someplace or uh, put them in a bag and and put them in the trash uh, make sure they're sealed up or if you can if you have a fire pit maybe burn them but uh, but don't just uh, don't compost them if they're diseased and don't leave them in the garden for sure because what happens is uh, in that debris um, insect pests and and disease pathogens particularly bacteria and uh, fungi spores will overwinter and then they'll show up when you plant in the spring so anyway, uh, the other thing too is improving your soils in, in accordance with your, uh, your soil test results. It, you, it's very important to improve your soils with organic matter like compost. Uh, also, you can, you can get and use pH amendments um, that, uh, that help to do that. Uh, Garden wine is one of them that if you're too acidic, you can put these, put it in and it will raise the pH. Uh, and most plants, most garden plants, most vegetable plants like it between pH between six and seven. Now there's some that like more acidic soil, like potatoes, for instance, and blueberries. And if you need to adjust it, there is soil acidifier that you can put in. To adjust it uh, down to more more acidic. So uh, anyway, uh, also, um, you if you need to adjust the amendments, you can fertilize, but be careful with fertilizers. Make sure you follow the instructions because <clears throat> over fertilizing is is a problem. It does, there's two things about it. It will cause uh, more succulent growth of your plant, but less fruiting actually because if you get too much of uh, potassium or phosphorus or something like that, it's going to impede the ability of the plant to fruit. The other thing too is that invites, uh, uh, that invites insect pests like aphids and other kinds of mites and other kinds of insects, and they love that kind of growth. The other thing that it does is the, is the plants will not be able to take up all the nutrients if you over fertilize, and so what happens to those? Well, they run off when you have heavy rains or something, they run off uh, or they percolate through the soil. Either way, they wind up, some of them wind up in our water systems and eventually wind up in our streams, lakes, ponds, rivers, and into the Chesapeake Bay. And you may think, well, so what? You know, in my little garden spot, that's not gonna make much difference. You don't think that way. Think in terms of the whole Chesapeake Bay drainage system where there are millions of such you know, lawns and gardens. And when the total cumulative effect from that can be really serious and has been in the past. So it's important that you maintain proper practices related to fertilizer. Um, and I use, I only use any more organic fertilizers uh, because they, uh, they tend to be um, slower in getting into uh, to things and, and also they're, they're natural substances and uh, they just are, don't have the impact uh, that chemical fertilizers can have. So anyway, um, the other thing too is uh, uh, besides uh, the improving your soils, keep soil moisture as even as possible. Now I know that's difficult when you have heavy rains and stuff like it looks like we're gonna have coming up here. Uh, but avoid as much as you can because it, it's going to rain so avoid as much as you can overhead watering because uh, with wet plants particularly going through the night and so forth that uh, invites disease use drip irrigation or soaker hoses <coughs> if practical if you're going to hand water make sure you water under the leaves uh, pruning plants as necessary to increase air circulation is important and also back to wet plants, avoid working with plants when they're wet because uh, it's easy for you then to pass pathogens from one plant to another, even if you're using gloves. 
uh, proper spacing of plants that has to do again with uh, helping air circulation to minimize disease, but also so that they don't compete with one another for uh, uh, for nutrients. Um, now, grow pest resistant plants, and you can find those in nurseries and online and other places. Uh, and you and and you can get seeds of this of of pest resistant plants, but that including deer resistance. I know some people were talking about that they wanted to hear about how to, uh, you know, how to control deer damage. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that. But one of them is, is there plants that are resistant to deer? Now I will say that a lot of plants that deer don't like when they're really starving and hungry, they'll eat almost anything. So that's why we say deer resistant, not deer proof. Uh, but use native plants and remove invasive plants. And we'll talk more about that, any invasive plants. Let me tell you one invasive plant that's really popular, but uh, we shouldn't be using it, is uh, is the butterfly bush. Not butterfly flower, but butterfly bush. Not butterfly weed flower, which is a native and it's uh, excellent. But there are other, but it is invasive. Part of the problem there is that the nectar on it really is not as nutritious as the native plants. And secondly, it can be invasive and spread, and uh, and you can get native bushes that are are pretty and uh, are more effective as far as uh, supporting our pollinators. Uh, proper timing in planting. We talked about the the uh, first and last um, uh, uh, the uh, frost dates in and not planting your late your hot weather plants till after that, but also. If you know the if you know what your the diseases and insects of your area are the insect pests particularly insect pests sometimes you can time your planting of those past the peak uh, of the of the insect infestation that you usually have and uh, so minimize that as well and uh, uh, you know we we can talk about that uh, later as well. Uh, this is a really important one. This could be a biological control, but we've included it under cultural. And that's uh, interplanting herbs, native and annuals and, and perennials to attract pollinators and, uh, and other beneficial insects and critters. Very important. And I'm talking about throughout your property, but also in your vegetable garden. Uh, actually make room in your vegetable garden for such things uh, because they will they will attract beneficials that will help you fight against uh, problems in your in your garden uh, other ones now I'm going to mention a couple that are yeah maybe okay but a, but a, maybe a, a interesting way to do it rotation of vegetables uh, vegetable crops well that's good on farms and larger gardens but it's not too effective on small gardens because you just really don't have room to do it um, but uh, one of the ways you could do a kind of modified rotation is to use uh, use containers one year now what do I mean by that well let's say you have let's take tomatoes let's say you have your tomatoes planted in a raised bed and uh, you have them planted there a couple of years, but you don't want diseases to get into the soil and so forth. So one year, instead of in your raised bed, you, you plant them in containers, or it can also be in a garden spot. It doesn't have to be in a raised bed, same principle applies. And you can actually plant, plant, uh, place those containers where you would plant them in that uh, raised bed. And so you do that for a year and then maybe you move them to another raised bed or something for a couple of years and repeat the process. So that way you are, you are in a sense doing a modified rotation of, of crops that helps uh, keep uh, contamination of the soil when you have the same crops over and over and over in the same place. Uh, you can also use uh, containers in hardscapes uh, like your patios, your decks, your sidewalk driveway and so forth. Uh, to extend your um, garden, or uh, even more importantly, perhaps to take advantage of your microclimate, the shade spots, the sun spots, and so forth. Uh, prompt harvesting is important. If you let fruits get overripe, that invites pests. Uh, and let me just say something real quickly there about 
uh, new thinking as far as tomatoes. You, you know, you've heard about how good vine ripened tomatoes are and so forth. Well, if you pick a tomato green and let it let it ripen, then that's true. It, does, it doesn't have the flavor as, as much as vine ripened. But they've done studies now that if you wait till the tomato first starts turning, you know, first starts, <coughs> excuse me, getting color, uh, like you have a red tomato and it starts turning pink, pick it early like that because there's some, they, they found that when that ripening process starts, it, it continues. You bring it in the house, you let it ripen, and they've done the taste comparisons and there really is, is no difference between those that ripen on the vine and, the refrigerator. And, and don't put them in the refrigerator though, or they won't ripen. But, uh, but anyway, and why is that important? Well, it's important because a lot of the pests, insect pests, uh, squirrels, birds, and so forth, like their fruit about exactly the same time we like our fruit. And so they hit it just about the time we want to pick it. And, uh, and so you get more damage. But if you do that, uh, studies have shown now that uh, there's, there's, uh, there's no issues with the tasting. Uh, other thing, weeding. Weeding is critically important. And the reason is, is because not only do they compete for nutrients, but weeds very often uh, are hosts for plant diseases and uh, uh, harmful uh, insect pests. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention under this is uh, mulch to hold in moisture and to prevent weeds. And another very important thing, to prevent soil from splashing up onto the plants. Because a lot of the diseases, both bacterial uh, and uh, uh, fungal particularly, are soil borne. And if the soil splashes up onto the plants, uh, a lot of times they bring those pathogens with them and infect the plant. So uh, mulch uh, helps to prevent that. A very good mulch to use is straw, but try to get good clean straw that's not, doesn't have a lot of weed seeds in it. Okay, so much for cultural practices. I'm, I'm gonna move, I'm moving rapidly because I got a lot to go over. So uh, physical strategies for prevention. Well, one of the things that's a good physical strategy are types of barriers. And I'm gonna talk about uh, several different types of what I'm including under this that maybe some of them aren't strictly speaking barriers, but I'm gonna include them under here. Uh, that's for insects and larger animals as well. But let me uh, let me dis, uh, dispense with insects to begin with. Floating row covers are really effective in deterring uh, flying insect pests if you make sure that they are solidly uh, connected to the ground. <laughs> you know, you have rocks or something that keep them because if they blow up and the insects get under them, then then it, they're not effective but they are otherwise. And if you know, for instance, like cabbages, let's use that as an example. I know that uh, the cabbage looper and cabbage worm butterflies, uh, butterfly, the cabbage looper moth, cabbage worm butterfly, and the banded uh, cabbage worm moth show up somewhere, or, you know, in, uh, uh, in May. And so if I plant my cabbages, say in April, then, you know, around the first of May or end of April, I may want to cover them. And then they, these, they can't get in to lay their, lay their eggs. And, uh, and they can be pretty devastated on all of your brassicas. Um, but you can do that with others too. If you know that flea beetles are going to come in towards the end of May, about the mid May, cover your eggplants, same thing. Um, but that's where the knowledge comes in and you need to know when things show up. Okay, so, so much for floating row covers and in flying insect pests. Now, let's talk about deer and larger animals, deer, groundhogs, rabbits, and so forth. <clears throat> and of course, these can be real problems in our area. Now, there are, I'm including these under barriers because I guess they're a kind of barrier. They're sound barrier, light bar barrier, water spray barrier, and even, uh, scent and taste barriers and I'm going to talk about under that. There are there are commercial items available although John Overstrom uh, builds his own motion detectors that emit sounds that are meant to scare the animals off uh, and these can be anything from threatening growl sorts of sound like John has uh, to 
uh, high frequency sounds that we can't even hear, but are very irritating to animals. Uh, some of them also, uh, they, they have strobe lights and when the animal tricks, trips the uh, motion detector, strobe lights come on. Some of them spray water uh, and, and some of them have combinations of those things. And they are somewhat effective as well. Uh, scent barriers and taste barriers, uh, these are sprays with offensive smells to them uh, and taste. And these work, I use them, and, and they particularly work, it's one of the few things that works with a groundhog, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but they also work with deer and everything. The only drawback to them is that they, you have to replace them every once in a while. If, there's, if it doesn't rain hard, they may last up to about two weeks, but you still have to, uh, you have to respray. If you get a hard rain, you're gonna have to respray right after that rain. But let me show you one of my favorites. A little show and tell here. This is repels all. And it's one of my favorite one because it's, it tends to repel uh, not just deer, but also groundhogs, which are my biggest nemesis. And it repels things like raccoons and possums and rabbits as well. So fences to deter deer, groundhogs, rabbits, and so forth. <clears throat> they can be effective, but uh, you have to have the right fence or the right uh, system. Uh, fences to deter deer and groundhogs, for instance, well, even raccoons too. Uh, deer can jump with a running start up to a seven foot fence. Uh, groundhogs, I don't know whether you know this or not, but they're grand climbers and they can climb over fences. They can also grand diggers and they can dig under fences and rabbits also can uh, go over fences. Raccoons are great climbers too. Uh, so if you're going to use just a single fence, it would have to be about eight feet tall and you would have to have part of it buried underground. Uh, and even that might not discourage everything. Uh, but one of the, it would discourage the deer certainly, but uh, there's more effective ways. And one of them is a compound fence that they use out at the uh, Double Oak Farms at the Chestnut Land Trust. And they have a regular six foot chain link, link fence around <coughs> the property, around the garden. And then about three or four feet out from that, they have a single wire fence around that's electrified. Now it's an extremely effective for deer because what happens is deer do not like to get into a confined area. Uh, and so if they, if they try to crawl under that wire or jump over that wire, they won't do it because they're closed in uh, between the wire and that. Plus they're probably gonna hit the wire and what happens is electrified and they get shot. Uh, that wire is set about three or three and a half feet so that it hits them like right across their chest area if, and they come up and they touch it and they get a shock. That has proven to be very effective. There's also something they call invisible fences you can get online. And these are, it's not a true fence, but they're posts that you put around your garden three or four, whatever you need. And they have a scent lure in them that the deer can hardly resist. And uh, when that, uh, when they come up to smell it, they're battery powered, they'll stick their nose up there and they'll get a shock. And that, uh, uh, that has proven to be effective too. But I think the most effective solution is some combination of the above, where you're doing more than one strategy, where you're uh, you know, coupling maybe sound with uh, some kind of other barrier with uh, yeah. smelly stuff. What about trapping? A fence. Uh, I also, with groundhogs, uh, I, groundhogs are my nemesis. I have no love lost for them. I do not think they're cute uh, animals. <laughs> one, they destroyed my entire garden one time in one night. And so I trap them now, alive trap them, and uh, I get rid of them that way. And that's all I will say. Um, so anyway, uh, biological strategies for prevention. Um, this is important for building and sustaining whole backyard ecosystems, uh, including beneficial insects, predators, parasites, pollinators, spiders, worms, beneficial nematodes, beneficial soil fungi and bacteria, birds, toads, frogs, lizards, and snakes even that uh, take care of a lot of different pests. 
snakes are really good on voles and moles, for instance. Um, and uh, there are beneficial soil fungi and bacteria, and you can get amendments for that to actually put in the soil. Uh, the beneficial bacteria help break down the, uh, the uh, components of the soil into nutrients that, they, that the uh, plants can take up. And there are symbiotic relationships with some soil fungi that, uh, that uh, attach to the roots of plants that actually help them to, uh, they, they, it helps them to draw the bacteria, but also helps them to take up the, uh, the nutrients. Um, so what you're looking for is to kind of build a whole backyard ecosystem. And there's a, a number of ways to do that. One is attracting beneficial insects with uh, and ways you do that is uh, you limit use of pesticides. Uh, you can provide cover and nesting sites, uh, water, little shallow uh, pans of water or, or dishes of water. And that's uh, for all of them for Does even- Does that also in attract mosquitoes? Even insects. Well, you have to monitor it. You know, you, you okay. don't want to just sit there, uh, but it'll, it'll evaporate it pretty fast if it's shallow too, but anyway, and then we talked about earlier interplanting with plants that attract beneficials and these should include a, a diversity of natural flowering and fruiting uh, plants that, uh, that are native throughout the property to include within your, your, uh, gar your vegetable garden. Now I have coming up here, I'm going to speed through this because I'm watching my time here and I've got quite a bit to do, but we're going to speed through some of the, uh, uh, these slides on beneficial insects. This is the ladybug and the, and it's larva, but the one over on the, uh, on the right side is an Asian ladybug and that is a pest. And, uh, you can tell it because it has a lot bigger white, patches on the cheeks. It has kind of an inverted table white patch on the back part of the head uh, and it's uh, orange rather than red, although there are some domestics that are kind of orange too. These things are usually tree dwelling. They can mass and cause a lot of problems if they get in your house and stuff. Don't step on them because they stink if you do. Uh, it's recommended that if they get in your house if they use a vacuum cleaner or something to suck them up. But anyway, I just wanted you to see the difference between their next and this is a, a green lace wing and larva. They're really good on aphids and mites and smaller insects as well that uh, their larva looks like a ferocious thing. Next is a surfed fly and its larva. And you see uh, its larva attacking here a, an aphid. Um, and they are, and, and that surfed fly is also a, a pollinator. And that's a fly, not a bee, even though it looks like fly. It's also called a, a flower fly. Next. All right, this guy is a really good one. The, the picture on my, on the uh, right hand side there is uh, in my garden. This is an assassin bug and he's got a, it's hard to tell that, but what he's got there is a, a stink bug and good on him because uh, they are a, a nasty pest. These guys hide and they ambush and they, they you have a proboscis that they stick the, uh, the, uh, uh, the other insect with and they inject digestive juices and then suck out their insides. It really sounds good, yum yum. Anyway, <laughs> next slide. Uh, soldier beetles, they, uh, they, they can ambush or, or they will hunt and, and, and eat other insects. Next. You, got, you know this guy, they'll eat anything to include each other. <laughs> Next. This is a ground beetle. They're actually predators, uh, also known as a darkling beetle. There's a lot of different species of them. They run around the ground. They're pretty fast and they catch whatever they can catch on the ground, insects and so forth to eat. They're good to have. Next. Uh, this is a minute pirate bug. You don't see them very often, but they're in there because they're a small bug. And this guy has speared. He does the same thing. He sucks out the inside. He has speared uh, a small caterpillar. Next. These guys are really good. They eat mosquitoes and other small uh, insects. Go. And so are these. And one of the, the wolf spider chases down its prey. The, the garden spider, which I think is really a beautiful spider, uh, 
spins a web and catches them that way next. All right, now this one I want to stop and just mention a little bit. This is a braconid wasp. There's a lot, of, almost every wasp actually is a predator. And they're also, a lot of them, pollinators at the same time. So they're really good to have around. But this guy is a braconid. You can see him on an index finger there. They're small wasps. But then you see that tomato hornworm up there that has all those little white things all over it. Those are cocoons. And what happens is the braconid wasp will come in and lay eggs all over these guys. And when they hatch, uh, the, the larva will spin a cocoon like that attached to them. And then they'll penetrate the skin and they'll do the same thing put in digestive juices and suck the insides out. And when you see a hornworm like this, leave it alone. It's all, it's not gonna eat anymore. It's already too sick and it's gonna die. And besides that, then you'll hatch out a bunch more braconid wasps that you want, they're your buddies. Okay, next. Uh, these, this, I'm gonna leave this to you. This is a list of plants that attract beneficial insects. This is by no means a complete one, but these are some of the better ones. <clears throat> but I'm going to leave that to you to, uh, uh, and, and if you want the, the slideshow, you'll have it and you'll get them because I need to speed up here. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there, it's, it's a very good thing to do. Okay, chemical strategies and what to use and when and the products. Okay, I'm going to do a, a, a quick show and tell here. Uh, in terms of, of things to prevent and treat uh, diseases, let me start with that. Okay, now I'm going to start with those things that would be organic, approved for organic. And one is neem oil. This is Bond neem. Now neem oil is really good uh, at uh, preventing diseases, also treating some things like powdery mildew that we'll talk about. The, the thing of it is, it's also, uh, it's also can be an insecticide because it's a horticultural oil and it will, if it gets on animals it'll, or insects it'll suffocate them uh, and so you've got to be careful that you don't spray when your beneficials are around here's another one uh, copper fungicide yeah move that water okay all right and uh, copper based fungicide this one is a three in one also but it has a sulfur based fungicide in it and i'm just showing it and this one this one for some reason is not uh, approved for organics. I don't know why, but sulfur based, you can find sulfur based ones that are. This one is a good disease control one and it's a bacterial based one uh, and uh, serenade for control. Now, when you're doing this, when you're, one of the things you want to do is when you first plant your plants, don't immediately start uh, spraying them with these because uh, they can they can hurt tender young plants. But after, like a tomato, for instance, after it's up about oh I don't know 18 inches, two feet, I start spraying long before any disease uh, comes in to to help prevent that. And uh, I spray uh, I spray. Uh, about every two weeks for prevention. Now, once disease shows up, you want to change that to uh, about every week. And the other thing too is uh, these pathogens can mutate and become resistant if you use the same one over and over and over again. So a really good strategy is to have like three or four of these and rotate them when you spray. Maybe neem oil, a copper base and a sulfur base and then repeat that pattern. There's some other really good ones that I'll show you here real quickly. Um, yep, lost the lid. Oh, wait a minute. Dacanil, uh, Dacanil fungal oil. By the way, those, those have the same ingredient in them. And then this Immunex, uh, but all of these are all of these are okay uh, from the standpoint that uh, they're they're not uh, dangerous and you can spray them right up to the day that uh, you harvest and I don't know why they're not approved for uh, uh, for organics but I use them I enter I intermix them with the others <clears throat> that are approved for organics so and in terms of uh, insecticides um, 
I don't think I'm going to take the time to show a bunch of them here, but uh, insecticides, I use only those that are approved for organics and the least to toxic. And these include horticultural oils, like neem oil, by the way, uh, and, a, and, and uh, soaps, uh, horticultural soaps, um, and also natural kinds of uh, extracts like uh, perithrins that come from daisies. Uh, the thing of it is, some of the, and for uh, particularly for chewing insects, <clears throat> I use a spinosad. Now, spinosad is a, uh, in BT. These two, uh, they are a bacteria based uh, BT that I'm showing you right now is particularly good on caterpillars, particularly young caterpillars. Uh, and other soft kinds of insects like white flies and so forth. Uh, this uh, is, uh, well, not so much white flies because they're sucking this in, never mind that. But the spinosad is really good on all, even on adult beetles and so forth that are chewing. And they, it has a couple of kinds of bacteria in it, and it's excellent. Um, and uh, so, anyway, those are, uh, if, if they're a sucking insect like a, a squash bug or uh, a uh, harlequin bug or a stink bug or something like that, the BT the, and the spinosad don't work. You're going to have to use the perinthrin or the insecticidal soap and so forth uh, and the horticultural oil to kill them. But you need to be careful because those are general uh, insecticides and they will kill the beneficial. So you really need to target them and know what you're doing. And when you do, they will kill the nymphs, they will kill the larva, they will kill the eggs, but you have to be really specific about it and take your time. And particularly with the eggs and the nymphs, very often you're not gonna see them unless you lift the leaves up. So you actually have to go out and do this by hand and even spray under the leaves and, and everything to, to kill these pests. Uh, but they are effective when you do that. Okay, so our time is running, so let me uh, very quickly run through some examples of, uh, of some, uh, in, or, or, uh, some diseases. The first one is a very common disease and it's called, uh, early blight. And you see this on tomatoes, uh, peppers, eggplants, and so forth. And, uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's one though, that's treatable and controllable. If you, if you, start spraying ahead of time, you can prevent it. If Once it shows up, if you spray it, spray it like weekly with a fungicide, you can slow and suppress it. And if you cut off the diseased leaves, that can even help more. And it usually starts from the bottom and works up. Uh, the next two we're going real fast through, uh, Fusarium wilt and uh, go to the next one. And that is uh, uh, Verticillium wilt. These are also uh, fungal diseases, uh, and the, the fusarian wilt tends to start from the bottom and go up, and you have a you have a wilting effect with the yellowing leaves, and ultimately they turn brown and die. Verticillium wilt is just the opposite; it starts from the top and all the way goes down, and these can be really devastating, and they're hard to control. And the best thing to do if if something's infected like that is just to pull them out. Um, Bacterial blight is another one in peppers that uh, you really need to pull out. And then there's cucumber mosaic virus and tobacco mosaic virus. So we'll skip over those pretty quick because uh, I want to get to late blight, which is a very, uh, it's a very bad disease. And uh, if this happens, this is what destroyed the potato crops in Ireland back in the 1840s. Uh, if you see this, you need to pull this out. You need to bag it up and you need to get it out of there and you need to do it quickly. Uh, because it will spread through the air too. And then blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is a, it's not a, it's not a disease so much as it, it's a uh, deficiency, a nutrient deficiency, a micro, an important micronutrient deficiency, and that's calcium. But it's treatable. Uh, and what happens is it's usually the result of either not amending the soil properly to begin with, but more likely uh, a lot of water a lot of rain or something that leaches it out and but if you use rock stop rock stop 
or if you use uh, other things high in calcium like bone meal and so forth in the soil. But rot stop is a foliar spray that you can spray on the, the, the leaves and also drench around the, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the ground to introduce calcium back in. It, you may have to do more than one treatment to end it, but you can end it and it will recover. So with that in mind, we're getting close to the end. Uh, I have a bunch of pictures of, uh, I have a bunch of pictures of insect pests. We're probably not gonna have time to go through all of them because I see we're coming up to at least, let's put it this way. At least we're not gonna be able to do it in the one hour presentation that's taped. If we can hang on for a little bit and I can answer questions and we can talk about those after the fact. But I wanna move, I wanna skip over those because basically just let me say that uh, what I said about those uh, insecticides, uh, the BT is good on caterpillars, the uh, spinosad good for any chewing insects, the sucking insects, you're gonna have to go to something like perinthrins or the horticultural oils or horticultural so. Website and it has all kinds of great information to include uh, how to test and that sort of thing. It also has a site on there called Ask an Expert, and you can ask them questions. You can load up, upload pictures and so forth. It may take a day or two to get it in recommendations. It's just a great site. That's probably the best site for home gardeners uh, around, and. Uh, but also another one is the Maryland Native Plant Society. They have a lot of natives and Chesapeake native plants uh, also have information, but they sell native plants. And uh, they're over at Rosaryville uh, State Park area in uh, Upper Marlboro. And the final one is a, uh, is a, a government website uh, and uh, I'm having trouble oh, reading it. But native anyway. plants are wildlife. Yeah, okay. That you can't get any more called uh, native plants for wildlife habitat and conservation landscape. But you go on this website and you can download that and it has all kinds of information about native plants and how to use them and where to use them, whether they take sun, shade. Uh, it's just a great, and, and, and a lot of plants to address certain problems that you have in your landscape. So uh, I highly recommend that and use it. So anyway, uh, we have, an, according to my count, about three minutes left in the hour. And so uh, Stop it. do you have any any questions that you want to ask? If, this, if you do want to stay on um, and we can talk about some of these uh, insect pests that I wasn't, was not able to show you, we can do that as well. So, any questions? So, could you yes. send us a list of the uh, chemical things you were recommending? Yes, what I plan to do uh, in my notes, my notes were a little bit sparse, but what I plan to do is uh, the notes that I will send out, the slides that I will send out, I'm gonna augment those with more information that I talked about so you'll have that. Perfect. Because I got some of them, but I don't know if I got all of them. I know, I started rushing because we're running out of time. <laughs> a lot of information, this is just part of it. So, I mean, I could have done, you know, several sessions on this actually, but, uh, but I wanna give other people a chance, so. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of the common insect pests that uh, that we weren't able to talk about. But let me just say, for our discussion purposes, some of them that are I'll, I'll mention to you some of the worst, and uh, and some of them that uh, um, that I really one of the one of the worst 
is uh, the squash bug and their nymphs. Uh, when they come in, they just absolutely explode. Uh, they lay a lot of eggs, they hatch fairly quickly, and they're just all over the place. They're a sucking insect, and they can uh, their infestation can be so quick that they kill they actually kill uh, cucurbits, particularly squash plants, but also cucumber and and uh, melon plants as well that they attack. And where the sun is out, so the hat goes on. <laughs> and uh, uh, th these again, you have to use the spinosad or the neem oil or the uh, or insecticidal soaps on them or the parenthesis. Uh, actually, neem oil is pretty good because neem oil, if you kill them with that, you're really doing something double. You're preventing uh, fungicide or fun funguses like powdery mildew, uh, which is common on your cucurbits, on your uh, uh, squash and your uh, uh, your cucumbers and melons and that sort of thing. So uh, neem oil is really good. Uh, the thing of it is, uh, in integrated pest management, they talk about going out to the garden with a, a pail of water or something, or a container with soapy water, and finding the insects and just brushing them into that, and it kills them. And that's fine if it's a small uh, infestation. There's not a whole lot of them. You can do that. Uh, but it's really difficult to do when you have something like the uh, squash bugs that, that just explode in their population so quickly. And I recommend you just go straight to uh, to the chemical kinds of solutions there. Uh, another one is uh, the flea beetle. Uh, flea beetle is, uh, is a little tiny beetle that gets on particularly eggplants. They love it. And you can tell they're on there because they make little bitty holes in there that, that kind of makes the leaf look like a sieve. <coughs> and, uh, and they can kill the, the leaves and the plants uh, if left unchecked. Uh, again, uh, since they're a chewing insect, the uh, spinosad it works on them, but let the other things do too. But I like to use spinosad on the chewing ones when I can. <clears throat> and you can spray that like a little bit of, you know, if, if you first, when you first see them show up, spray it because uh, that uh, will keep the uh, That'll keep the infestation low. And they're so small, you really can't pick them by hand anyway. Another one is that's really bad is the stink bug. There's one called the brown uh, marmorated stink bug that's a invasive species. And these do a lot of damage. They're sucking insect again, not only to plants, but one of these just drives me nuts as they get onto the, they're one of those that like to show up just as the fruit is getting ripe and they, they suck stuff out of it. They discolor the fruit. I mean, you can still eat it if you get it before, but also it increases the rotting of the fruit so that they rot faster and they don't last as longer. And uh, again, you're going to, you're going to use the oil soaps, rinse and that sort of thing to, to kill those. Um, another one's harlequin bugs. And that's because they, um, uh, harlequin bugs, uh, reproduce real quickly also. And so you need to get to them quickly. Uh, there's one called the uh, spotted cucumber beetle, uh, and, and this is true of a lot of a lot of the insects, not just them, but they carry viral diseases that uh, uh, like uh, the mosaic viruses, but also uh, the wilt uh, viruses and so forth that uh, insect plants. So, anyway, those just to mention a few are are some of the uh, some of the real bad actors that I wanted to mention and. Uh, Again, uh, I hope I hope this was helpful and that you learned something and that uh, if you have any questions, I'm still here to try to answer whatever I can. And I will I will make sure you get more information on this. Uh, I will expand my uh, my notes on on the uh, on the slides for you before I send them out. Thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> You're quite welcome. A lot.